Now we're prepared to understand why some Fourier components are strongly represented in an EM image and why some are lost. Let's begin by drawing the sample and the lens that collects the scattered radiation and below an image plane. Now let me draw the incident electron and I'll draw it as a plane wave coming down, interacting with the sample. Now, when that electron wave hits the sample, some of it will be unscattered, and some of it will be scattered. The single electron can experience all of these phenomena, and its contribution to the final image depends on how all of these processes uh, interfere with each other. And so let's first think about the unscattered part of that electron wave. So the electron wave hits the sample, and then from here, let me just draw it as a wavy line to again remind us that as that wave propagates down through the microscope, the phase of the electron wave is uh, oscillating uh, in uh, around from 0 to 360 to 0 to 360 and so it oscillates again i don't mean to mean i don't mean to suggest that the wave is moving to the left and then moving to the right and moving to the left or anything like that it's just whatever the wavelength whatever is oscillating in the electron that gives it its wave like properties and its wavelength it is uh, it is progressing as it moves down the microscope in this fashion and it traverses so many wavelengths from the position of the sample down to the position of the image plane. Now remember that when the unscattered part of the electron hits the image plane, it, it fills that space. I've just represented it as a single oscillating line uh, as it travels down through the microscope. And when it hits the image plane, it will have a particular phase. And so let's draw an argon diagram now and represent that unscattered part of the electron beam as a vector. And let's call it psi unscattered. And it has an arbitrary phase. It, it, there was a number of wavelengths as it passed from the sample to the image plane, and so it will hit the image plane with some arbitrary phase. Here I've drawn it as, a, as approximately 45 degrees, but that's not the important thing. So we'll just draw it in that position. Now let's consider another part of the electron that is scattered into some angle. And for now, let's just draw it as an angle like this. So part of the electron will be scattered by the sample into lots of different directions. This is the first direction we're going to consider. And scattering in this direction will be refocused uh, back on so that it interferes on the image plane with the unscattered beam. Now there's two key differences between the scattered beam here in blue and the unscattered beam in green. The first difference is that upon scattering, the blue curve uh, suffers a phase shift of 90 degrees. It emerges from the sample 90 degrees behind the unscattered beam. Now why is this so? Let's think again for a second about the analogy of a photon being scattered by an atom. So let's imagine an atom with a nucleus and an electron cloud around that nucleus. And so we have a single electron in the, in the cloud around the atom. And let's suppose we have an incoming photon. Now in the case of a photon, we know what it is that's oscillating. It's an electric field. Photons are oscillating electric fields. And when this electric field interacts with an electron in an atom, uh, it, we can imagine that it causes that electron to move up and down and up and down because electrons experience forces in, in electric fields. And as that electron is moving up and down, we also know that moving electric charges create electric fields. And so a charge that's moving up and down causes an electric field disturbance that will 
move outwards away from that movement and propagate in little circles away from that uh, up and down trajectory. In a driven oscillator, I want you to imagine that there's a, an, a lever arm that's moving up and down and up and down and just oscillating. And on that arm, there's a spring with a mass below it. So as the lever arm moves up and down, the mass on the spring uh, may go with it like this. It turns out that each spring has a resonant frequency. And in, under some conditions, if, if the oscillation of the driver is lower than the resonant frequency of that spring, then the mass and the lever arm will move up and down together. If, however, the oscillations of the driver are faster than the resonant frequency of the spring, then what will happen is they'll be opposite of each other. The driver and the mass will move up and down like this. If in the third case, the driver is moving up and down at the resonant frequency of the spring, then what will happen is as it moves down, it compresses the spring, which then pushes the mass down. And then as the driver starts rising, the mass will stop and then start following it up. Then the driver will turn around and start pushing down, and that will push, push the mass down. And I, I can't do it very well with my hands, but what happens is that the driver and the mass are exactly 90 degrees out of phase. And this is what I want you to imagine might happen when a photon drives an electron up and down. That the scattered radiation that emerge from that electron bouncing up and down will be emitted exactly 90 degrees behind the driver oscillations of the incoming photon. And so it could be that what happens with electrons is similar. That whatever is oscillating up and down in an electron, when it hits an atom in the sample, something in that atom is caused to oscillate and scatter the radiation in turn. And the scattering emerges 90 degrees behind the incoming electron wave. And so after this part of the electron that's scattered, this wave emerges 90 degrees out of phase with the unscattered wave. So that's the first big difference between the scattered beam and the unscattered beam. The second difference is that they travel different path lengths. So the distance that the unscattered beam travels is from here to the image plane. But the distance that the scattered beam travels is over to this position, then it's bent and brought back to the image plane. And there's a difference in the path length, delta L. And because of that, the scattered wave will be additionally phase shifted compared to the unscattered wave. Now if that path length difference is, for instance, a fourth of a wavelength, then this will correspond to an additional 90 degrees phase shift compared to the unscattered wave. And the third thing you need to know about the scattered wave is that its amplitude is very small compared to the unscattered wave for the kinds of samples that we'll image in cryo-EM. So if we were to add a vector representing this scattered wave to our argon diagram, the unscattered wave is headed in this direction. The scattered wave would be short in comparison because the amplitude of the scattered component is less than the unscattered component by a lot. So it's short. In addition, it's 90 degrees phase shifted because of the scattering process. But in addition to that, it's a further 90 degrees phase shifted because it has to travel an additional path length equivalent in this imagined case of a quarter of a wavelength. And so the total phase shift is the full 180 degrees. And as a result, this scattered wave will add to the unscattered wave in the opposite direction. And the sum of those two waves together will be, could be represented by a vector
like this, which is significantly shorter than the unscattered uh, vector itself. So, down here in the detector, I'm going to draw a particular pixel of this detector. And as these two waves interfere with each other as they pass through that detector, you'll see that because the small blue wave is a full 180 degrees out of phase with the green wave, the sum of those two waves is now going to have a much lower amplitude than the unscattered beam itself. Let me add some labels. The blue curve is the scattered component, and the red curve is the total, the sum of the two. Now I'm going to draw a graph. And the horizontal axis is going to be spatial frequency. And the vertical axis, axis is going to be called contrast. And contrast is going to vary from 1 to negative 1. And what we're going to do is, as a function of spatial frequency, we're going to plot how much a wave at that spatial frequency can be seen, or how much of that wave has an impact in the sum within the detector. Now this scattered wave is scattering at some particular spatial frequency. Let's just say that it, it, it corresponds to a spatial frequency here um, along uh, this axis. And we can see here that the blue curve contributes maximally in that it, it is 180 degrees out of phase with the unscattered curve. And so it shortens the sum maximally. And so I'm going to put a single spot here for that blue curve here, corresponding that its full amplitude is seen in the sum and it contributes negatively, for instance, like that. OK, some of this will be clear when we start drawing additional curves. Now let's consider the part of the electron that's scattered to an even higher angle. OK, so it's scattered out here. And then from here, the lens focuses it back in here to interfere with the other, with the, the other waves within the detector. Now in this case, if we were to draw the argon diagram, it would again, it would look like this. The green wave, again, will represent it as a vector. That's the unscattered component of the electron. Now, this magenta scattered component here will have a much smaller amplitude, and it will be phase shifted with respect to the unscattered beam for two reasons. First of all, when it's scattered, it, it suffers the same phase shift of 90 degrees. And in addition, its path length is, is quite different than the path length of the unscattered beam. In fact, if the path length difference of the blue curve was, say, uh, a quarter of a wavelength, the difference in path length here might be, uh, say, a half of a wavelength or correspond to a full 180 degree phase shift. In that case, if we were to plot a vector that represented this scattered wave on the argon diagram, first of all, it would be phase shifted relative to the unscattered wave by 90 degrees because of the scattering process, and then an additional 180 degrees because of the additional path length that it travels. And as a result, we would draw it in that position. So that's the scattered wave. And the sum of those two waves is now this. And the key thing to recognize is that this magenta wave scattered at this spatial frequency is essentially invisible to the detector. Because what the detector is going to detect is the amplitude of that electron wave squared. And so because the amplitude of the total wave here
is essentially the same as the amplitude of the unscattered wave. The magenta wave is essentially invisible. It contributes nothing. It, it doesn't change the probability of detecting an electron there. And so we're going to mark its contrast as zero. So I'll, I'll make that point magenta. Now the reason I'm drawing it further along uh, this axis, which is spatial frequency, is because it was scattered to higher angle. And remember that the, ang the scattering angle is proportional to spatial frequency. Remember that at the back focal plane of the lens exists the Fourier transform of the sample density. And so the unscattered beam represents the zero spatial frequency component of the image, which is here at the beginning of this spatial frequency axis. And as we proceed to higher and higher scattering angles, we're moving to higher and higher spatial frequency components of the image. Close to the origin here, or here, these are low resolution details. Far from the optical axis at high scattering angles are high spatial frequencies. So as we move to higher and higher angles, I'm going to plot the points further and further out. So let's plot the next one. Let's consider the part of the wave that's scattered to yet higher angle. And imagine that it is focused by the lens. My drawing wasn't big enough, but it was focused by the lens. And so it comes back to interfere with the unscattered beam and the others. Now the path length here now is quite a bit longer than the path length of the unscattered beam. And if we were to represent the situation in an argon diagram, the unscattered beam would be represented again like this, a single vector. So that's the unscattered beam. And now in this case, the scattered wave has a small amplitude because it's a scattered beam, and it's phase shifted by 90 degrees because of the scattering event. In addition, let's imagine that the path length difference here corresponds to three quarters of a wavelength, or a 270 degree phase shift. In this case, there's another 270 degree phase shift, phase delay, because of the additional path length that it traversed. In this case, the vector ends up pointing in the same direction as the unscattered beam. And so to find their sum, we would add it to the tip, pointing in the same direction. So that's the scattered beam. And the sum of these two beams now is this full length. So that's the total beam. As a result, the beam that's scattered at this spatial frequency adds up with the unscattered beam with a phase shift that makes it fully visible. Its full extent is manifest in the amplitude of the total wave. And because of that, we would graph, if this is the spatial frequency of the orange um, scattered wave that we're considering right now, we would give its contrast at 1 because it's fully visible. It has the same phase as the unscattered wave and becomes fully visible in the total wave. And so we would plot it here. Now, you're probably starting to see the pattern. There will be a part of the scattered wave that's scattered to even higher angle. And that will be focused by the lens to interfere with the unscattered wave. And in this case, the phase shift will not only be 90 degrees, but if this additional path length corresponds to a full, one single full wavelength, then its phase shift will be an additional 360 degrees. And so its additional phase shift because of the path length will bring it all the way back into pointing in this direction. And as a result, it will add with the unscattered beam like this, and the, that's the scattered component we're considering, 
And so the total will be here. And the amplitude of the sum is essentially the same as the amplitude of the unscattered beam. And so this Fourier component is essentially invisible to the image. And so if we plot that here at this spatial frequency, it contributes zero. Its contrast is zero. Now the last beam I want to consider is a beam that is scattered by the sample, but to very low angle. And so I'm going to draw it right alongside the unscattered beam. It was scattered, but to very low angle. And because of that, when we draw the argon diagram to represent the situation, the unscattered beam is as it always has been. Now, this scattered beam to very low spatial frequency now suffers a 90 degree phase shift but no additional phase shift because it, it follows almost the same path as the unscattered beam. So there's no additional phase shift due to a different path length. And so the phase shift is simply the 90 degrees due to scattering. And so we would draw it here. That's the scattered beam. And the total is now this. And you can see that the a scattered beam to very low spatial frequency is almost invisible in the image because its phase shift of 90 degrees um, causes it not to impact the total amplitude of the sum. And so if we plot it on our plot here, it's at zero spatial frequency and its contrast is zero. It, 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 does, it fails to change the image. Now, if we were to consider all kinds of scattering directions in between, you would see that each one, because of the different path length, its contribution would vary from no contribution at zero spatial frequency to a full negative contribution uh, here at this position. It would vary like that. And then past that, it would move around into a position where again it had no contribution to the image. And that was this point, this magenta curve. In between here and the orange curve, these spatial frequencies would contribute more and more and more till eventually at the orange curve they were contributing fully because they were in phase with the unscattered beam, and so they rise to this fully contributing situation. Then between the orange curve and the purple curve, these spatial frequencies suffer path length differences that cause them to roll around the circle in this way until they are once again invisible, and that was the situation with the purple curve. And if we were to think about spatial frequencies at higher and higher and higher scattering angle, we would see that they contribute more or less in an oscillatory fashion as a function of spatial frequency. And this curve is what we call the contrast transfer function, or CTF, of the electron microscope. Now more, more specifically, what we've just drawn out is the phase contrast transfer function, meaning that it tells us how much contrast is transferred into the image as a function of spatial frequency. For each of these spatial frequencies, it answers the question, how much of that Fourier component is actually transferred into the final image? And as we can see, some of the, the spatial frequencies, like this one, is transferred fully at a value of 1. Others are entirely invisible, where these spatial frequencies where the contrast transfer function crosses 0, these are spatial frequencies that are essentially missing 
in the image. And there are spatial frequencies, for instance, this spatial frequency, where its Fourier component is fully present in the image, but the contrast it contributes is acts actually in opposite direction of these other spatial frequencies. Now remember that each of these scattered waves represents a particular Fourier component of the density present in the original sample. Remember when we took a complex function and took its Fourier transform, that separated it into all of the Fourier components. There were some low frequency waves, for instance a wave that might have oscillated once across uh, the, the unit size of the sample. There was another higher frequency component that oscillated twice. There were others that oscillated four or five times. And the, the most extreme spatial frequency that could be present in a digital image is a wave that oscillates up and down every other pixel. And so each of these uh, scattered waves represents one of those sine waves that is needed to produce a magnified image of the sample in the image plane. Now do not confuse the spatial frequency of the information that those waves carry with the frequency of their oscillation as they traverse through the microscope. These are different frequencies we're talking about. It's a single electron that comes through the column one at a time and hits the sample. That single electron is scattered into many different directions. Some of it remains unscattered and unphase shifted. Other parts of it are scattered into each of these possible different directions, and in fact all of the directions around the full circle. And each of these components has exactly the same wavelength as the unscattered beam, because it's all part of the same electron. And that electron has a wavelength set by its energy. For instance, in a 300 kilovolt microscope, the wavelength is approximately 2 picometers. And so as it travels down the microscope column, whatever it is about an electron wave that's oscillating, the wavelength there is about 2 picometers. And so the wavelength of all of these beams is the same. They are phase shifted relative to each other because of the scattering event and because they're different path lengths. By, they're brought together by the lens to re-interfere at the image plane. Uh, because they have the same wavelength, they add up uh, just like in the previous slide where we had two different wave functions that had the same wavelength, but they were phase shifted with respect to each other slightly. And because of that, some of them added significantly to the sum, and others did not add significantly to the sum. Whether or not they add or not, this is dependent on the phase shifts that are created by the electron microscope through the scattering event and the difference in path lengths. So all of these have the same wavelength because they're part of the same electron. And when they recombine in all of the individual pixels of the detector, in each pixel there is a probability of that single electron being detected. The probability is proportional to the amplitude of the wave function at that position squared. And whether or not each of these scattered components contributes significantly to that sum depends on the scattering angle and the phase shift that they, that, that they suffer as they travel through the microscope. Some of them contribute fully. Others are totally lost to the image, and others contribute uh, in a negative sense, uh, or at least an opposite sense compared to what the others are contributing. But each one is carrying a separate Fourier component of the ultimate image that needs to be present. Now, to try to help make this a little clearer, let me compare it to, say, an orchestra. In an orchestra, you have all kinds of different instruments. You have the violins playing the high notes, you have cellos playing medium notes, and you have basses playing low notes. 
And you could be in the audience and you could be listening to the orchestra. And you hear all the high and the medium and the low notes all combined. That would be like a perfect microscope that delivered all of the spatial frequencies at their full volume. The contrast transfer function of a perfect microscope would look like this, meaning that all the spatial frequencies were delivered at full contrast, one. And so, for instance, the violins are here at high frequency, the cellos are at some intermediate frequency, and the basses are at low frequency, playing the low notes. And when you listen to the orchestra, they all come to you, and so you hear them all. Unfortunately, in an electron microscope, not all of the components of the signal are transferred or delivered into the final image. Some of them are fully transferred, others are silenced, and others are transferred with opposite contrast. In the orchestra analogy, this would be like putting a microphone above, say, the cellos, so that you hear the cellos fully, but uh, putting another microphone by the basses and the sound that they create, actually instead of adding that sound to the total, somehow subtracting it away so that it comes in a negative sense. And finally, uh, not microphoning at all, say, the violins. The violins without a microphone would be like a position here in spatial frequency where you don't hear them at all. So contrast transfer function tells us how much of each of these components are going to arrive at the image. Just like placing the microphones in different positions in an orchestra tells you which of the instruments will you hear strongly and which will be silenced. Now the exact form of the contrast transfer function can be derived exactly, considering issues like the additional path length suffered by each of the scattered beams. And you can find that in books. And its derived form is that the contrast transfer function turns out to be the sine of pi times a term d focus times the wavelength of the radiation, in this case the incident electron, times spatial frequency squared, that's this spatial frequency, plus pi times the coefficient of spherical aberration of the objective lens, times wavelength cubed, times spatial frequency to the fourth power, divided by two. This is the derived form of the contrast transfer function.